The release of Gaia DR2 on April 25, 2018 sparked a revolution in astronomy. It also created many challenges and opportunities for data visualization, both for research and public outreach. How do you visualize more than a billion stars? One approach is this animation created using a subset of the Hipparchus and Gaia data with the Gaia Sky 3D simulator. This is a flight from a location above Arneb in the Vela Supershell, just outside of the solar neighborhood, to Alpha 1 Capricorni in the Aquila South molecular clouds. During this journey, an imaginary starship would pass through the Merzam tunnel between the Orion OB1 and Vela OB2 associations and travel through the local bubble along the Scorpius OB2 association. In the Gaia Sky animation, we flash by stars in these associations, but their identity is unclear because the presence of these structures, like that of many astronomical structures, is determined by star density. Other than the occasional dense star cluster or distant spiral arm, the human eye cannot discern more subtle variations in star density. Fortunately, extracting density structures from point clouds can be done using well-known algorithms, most commonly used in medical applications. These algorithms can extract 3D structures at a variety of different densities. For example, here is a pelvis selected using bone density, and here's brain tissue selected using soft tissue density. We can use the vast Gaia DR2 dataset to effectively carry out MRI scans of the Milky Way. Bowie and Alves pioneered this technique using Hipparchus data in a paper published in 2015. <clears throat> the density algorithm has two main phases. First, we convert the point cloud into a discrete scalar density field using a kernel density estimator. And secondly, we convert the scalar field into a sequence of slices and extract 3D isosurfaces of constant density from the slices using the marching cubes algorithm. Once we have 3D meshes, there are a large variety of viewing options, including rendering applications like Blender and virtual reality standards like WebXR. There are several Python libraries that provide kernel density estimators. One of the fastest is FFT KDE in the KDE uh, Pi library. There were several kernel functions available in this library, uh, but the uh, Gaussian kernel seems to generate the smoothest results. There's also a SciPy Gaussian filter function that's also fast and generates very similar results. Um, so if you're familiar with the SciPy library, uh, you don't really need to use anything else. We, you can just use the, the Gaussian, Gaussian uh, filter uh, function uh, to get the, these results. Implementing a kernel density estimator requires selecting a bandwidth value typically in the form of a standard deviation sigma. This essentially determines the amount of smoothing that you want to apply to the data. There's at least one library that attempts to select this bandwidth automatically, but it's very slow and works reliably only with, band with point clouds that have a single density peak, something that's definitely not the case for the Gaia data. I've been using a heuristic that I call the Dremel principle after Gaia astronomer Ronald Dremel. This involves selecting the maximum possible bandwidth that reveals the structures that you want to visualize because a higher bandwidth reduces noise. For example, after comparing results for Gaia star density clumps within 800 parsecs, it appears that a bandwidth of 8 parsecs 
shows structures in the solar neighborhood without smoothing them out of existence. So if we chose a bandwidth uh, lower than eight parsecs, we would get um, uh, more noise. Uh, and if we chose a bandwidth higher than eight parsecs, we would actually start to lose structures that we want to uh, showcase in our, in our map. Once we have computed our scalar density field, we can output it in a sequence of slices, uh, much like an MRI scan. Uh, and this is an example of uh, a, uh, a density uh, slice uh, from uh, the solar neighborhood out to about 800 parsecs. Uh, and it's a slice uh, through uh, the uh, galactic plane. Um, these slices can then be read and displayed directly by an application called a voxel viewer. And uh, voxel viewers are often used in medicine to be able to interactively view structures of varying tissue density with, uh, in one data scan. Um, so this particular application, for example, uh, shows a bone structure, um, but by uh, varying uh, the uh, density structures that you're choosing, you can also display um, uh, surface tissues or different kinds of organs like kidneys, for example. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, for this kind of application, it's very convenient to be able to interactively select uh, the uh, density or display multiple densities at the same time. Uh, however, it's also common to convert the data to 3D meshes as these can then be input into many kinds of uh, standard 3D uh, rendering software, uh, you know, whether it's something like Blender or virtual reality applications. Uh, and this usually involves the marching cubes algorithm, which was invented by Bill Lawrenson and Harvey Klein in 1984. Marching cubes takes a density value and outputs isosurfaces of constant density. Uh, much like we might see contour lines in a topographic map. I've been using uh, the VTK slice cubes function in the uh, Python VDK uh, binding uh, because it can generate isosurfaces from large data sets. Um, but there are definitely other marching cube libraries that are easier to use, like the one in um, my uh, by. Uh, or in uh, scikit image. When uh, creating star density maps, it usually makes sense to combine mesh meshes created from multiple densities of data selections. Um, for example, uh, uh, what uh, I'm showing here is a map uh, created uh, by starting with isosurfaces generated with uh, a very high, uh, very smooth bandwidth and uh, low densities from a selection of upper, uh, of upper uh, main sequence stars. Um, so uh, this combined data from Star Horse um, uh, and uh, several other uh, sources. Uh, we can then include uh, lower bandwidth and higher density star clumps from a larger selection of main sequence stars. Uh, so this is uh, uh, taken uh, directly this time just from the Gaia, uh, Gaia DR2 data. Um, you, you do need to make sure that you choose your absolute magnitude cutoff to ensure that Gaia can see your star selection right out to the boundary of the region that you're mapping. So in this case, um, I chose an absolute uh, magnitude uh, cutoff um, uh, in, chosen in a way uh, to ensure that uh, Gaia can see right out to 800 uh, parsecs. Um, if you don't uh, implement an absolute magnitude cutoff like that, um, you're in danger of mapping uh, what Gaia can see rather than the Milky Way. Um, so then what I did is combine uh, data from uh, many other sources uh, for example, Rosine uh, Lalamance uh, dust uh, extinction data set, um, H2 regions, um, uh, several open cluster catalogs, uh, luminous star uh, data from Star Horse, 
uh, and uh, labeling uh, various features. Um, so if you combine uh, the data, uh, which is uh, generated in a consistent way, um, ultimately all from the Gaia uh, and uh, occasionally Hipparchus data sets, um, then you get uh, very interesting and very detailed maps. There are several maps available online or for download, but perhaps the most elaborate so far is an upper main sequence star density map that goes out to five kiloparsecs with detailed sources, a legend, and the ability to search for stars and nebula. Since this is a 3D map, we can also fly through it. This animation follows approximately the same route as the Gaia Sky animation I showed earlier. Ideally, it would be possible to toggle between a realistic Gaia Sky view and a map view, much like Google Maps allows you to toggle between a satellite view and a map view. Gaia Sky cannot currently handle the mesh translucency display that would, re that would require, but I hope that some kind of display toggle will be possible in the future. The maps can be used for all kinds of public outreach uh, once you've uh, constructed them, including shirts, wall calendars, mugs, board games, posters, and virtual reality applications. And perhaps inevitably, I've been working with Star Trek fans to overlay Star Trek regions on a real map of the solar neighborhood. I'd like to thank Ron Dremel. Yosta Braun and Anthony Brown for their continuous support for this project, as well as all the Kickstarter supporters who funded the graphics workstation used to produce all these images and animations. Please follow me on Twitter at galaxy underscore map if you want to find out more. Thank you.